All right, you already know who it is, man. I'm back at it once again. I know I've been away for a while, man, but you know, I'm still here, man. Still researching, man. We're back with another one right here. So, again, what we're dealing with is the quantum nature of ancient structures. And as always, I come to you in truth, wisdom, and knowledge because that is the way. I'll tell you, so let's get straight into this. Were the Giza pyramids designed to be electrical conduits? The pyramids of Giza said to be tombs for pharaohs according to mainstream archaeologists, but this has proved to be false due to the simple fact that no bodies have ever been found in the pyramids. As a result, a new theory for the function of the pyramids became the popular consensus. The pyramid power plant theory which explains that the pyramids was part of an ancient power plant for harnessing the power of electricity. But is the power plant theory really the final chapter for the pyramids? So basically it's what this video is all about. I want to deal with, I want to assess and analyze the megalithic structures found in Egypt and determine the accuracy of the pyramid power plant theory. I want to put the pyramid power plant theory under the microscope right here. I want to assess and evaluate the accuracy of the pyramid power plant theory. I want to deal with this. All right. So again, I want to I want to deal with this. I want to see is is the pyramid power plant theory the true theory or are is there something that we're missing? Is there a greater mystery that has yet to be explored? So now also recently now a few news outlets published that you know the Great Pyramid of Giza can focus electromagnetic energy. You see what I'm saying? So again, it shows now that pyramid power plant theory now it's become popular as a popular theory now it's almost even mainstream now almost. You see what I'm saying? So I want to see if this theory holds up. I want to analyze this. So again, this is going to be an excellent video. We're going to deal with some stuff. It's going to be groundbreaking. So let's again, let's deal with this. So let's go to the next one. Pyramids defy natural laws. The pyramids and other megalithic structures around the world defy natural laws of physics. From the sizes of the stones that were moved to the shapes and impossible degree of accuracy that the stones were cut, leave modern physicists baffled to how the ancients made it all possible. Now one key factor is that the ancient megalithic structures seem to defy the laws of gravity. How entire stones weighing tons were stacked on top of each other despite the force of gravity pulling things down is a tremendous feat of science and engineering. Now, in previous videos, I've spoken about physical attributes such as weight, density, and mass. But in order to build these structures, these engines would have to go take into consideration all of those attributes. But on a quantum level, it is the Higgs field that governs the density and mass of particles of matter. And according to modern physicists, it is gravity that governs the weight. So to perform these feats, ancients would have to have employed an advanced technology on a tremendous scale that would have both manipulated gravity and the Higgs field itself. But one interesting thing about the Higgs field is that, according to modern physicists, all particles interact with it. So again, all particles interact with it now, thus giving them mass, right? But they said that the photon the particle of light doesn't interact with it, therefore it is left massless. You see what I'm saying? And the reason why I want to I want to go into this, I want to go into this because I thought about this. You know what I'm saying? I thought about this. I've been sent this. I've been I've been, been sent this information quite some time, right? But now it's time to release this now. But and I thought about it. So again, it says that the photon doesn't interact with the Higgs field, therefore it's left massless, right? But that doesn't really make much sense because how can the photon just not interact with it? If we have a field that's, you know, that's permeating this this, this ever pervasive field that's everywhere. It's all around you, you know. How can a photon just not interact with it, right? So, so yes, it is true that a photon has no mass. But, you know, based on their standard model, it has no mass. Because otherwise, you would feel the weight of light, but we don't. You see what I'm saying? So, again, that is true that it has no mass, right? Well, again, but just saying that it just doesn't interact with the Higgs field, that's not enough. So, my theory is that what if, and I think I did touch on this in another video, what if the photon is not an elementary particle? What if 
The, there is a more subtler particle than the photon, and the photon is merely an offshoot, right, of this much more subtler particle. And this subtler particle is the one that interacts with the Higgs field itself. You see what I'm saying? So again, we're going into some stuff right here. Again, the quantum, again, the quantum mysteries right here. We're going into it, we're breaking it down. You see what I'm saying? The quantum nature, you know, we're going into some stuff, you know. But the reason why the pyramids defy the laws of physics is because it was not built on the third dimension. When they were first constructed, it was built on a much higher dimension where the laws of physics would have been different. But this makes sense because according to modern physics now, according to modern physics now, they say that the reason why gravity now appears weaker than the other known forces is because it may occupy other dimensions. You see what I'm saying? So if that's the case, this explains why the pyramids defy gravity, as they were built on the higher dimensions. So the builders could further manipulate gravity and these other forces to perform these great feats. So again, this is bound in science right here, guys. This is bound in science. This is bound in modern science, modern physics. You see what I'm saying? This fits the model. You see what I'm saying? This fits the model. That's, what, that's why I'm going to have to deal with this video, because it really fits the model. You see what I'm saying? So again, guys, we're dealing with some stuff. So again, let's go to the next one. Internal pyramid structure. Now, in previous videos, I focused on the external aspect of the pyramids. You know, such as the materials used, you know, the, the purpose of the shapes, things of that nature. Now I want to take a close, closer look at the internal aspect so now on the left we see the internal structure of the great pyramid also known as the pyramid of khufu then in the middle is the internal structure of the bent pyramid and to the far right now is the internal structure of the red pyramid of snefru you see so again we know it's a different internal structures but the common denominator between all these internal structures is that they all have a descending passageway as we can clearly see right here they all have a descending passageway right that's the common denominator with all pyramids i've only shown i've only shown these three right here but that's the common den denominator between all pyramids they all have a descending passageway it's always a descending passageway right so now i want to explain the reason why the entrance to the pyramid is always a descending passageway rather than an ascending passageway so in, terms of, in terms of the pyramid power plant theory, they say that it was powered by water, right? So again, it would make sense from a, from a perspective of water how it would be a descending passageway because if the water came down here now, you know, due to, due to the force of gravity now, you know, again, modern physics now, due to, the, due, due to the force of gravity now, it would have pulled the water down now, you see what I'm saying? Again, that's why, so it makes sense from a dis, it being a descending passageway now, you know, dealing with gravity, right? Again... Dealing with gravity now, but uh, but also now, but uh, but another reason why the structure begins with a descending passageway when you're dealing with resonance and vibration, as as in order for the structure to properly resonate, the force now would have to be directed down and deep into the structure. You see, what I'm saying, come down deep into the structure so that way it could properly resonate, properly vibrate. You see, what I'm saying, it would have to come right down deep into the structure so it makes sense why it's a descending passageway from those two aspects you see what i'm saying so that makes sense you see but so now i really i just, I just again i really trying to assess the pyramid power plant theory you know what i mean I, just, I really want to assess it and that's what this video is really about whether or not the, the pyramid power plant theory really is a truly accurate theory i really want to assess this you see what i'm saying i want to evaluate this all right so let's go to the next one The descending passage. So now what we have right here now, we see the descending passageway. On your left, you see the descending passageway of the Great Pyramid. Right? And on your right is the descending passageway of the Pyramid of Snefri, the Red Pyramid. Right? So now, as you can see from this picture, you see the handrails. You see the handrails now. You see some kind of steps. You see. And now, so obviously, the Egyptian government has added those to make it easier for tourists to navigate through the passageway, navigate through the pyramids. But when the structure was originally built, those wouldn't have been there. 
You see what I'm saying? You wouldn't have had no handrails. You wouldn't have had those steps. So it would have been quite difficult for somebody to navigate through this structure would na to navigate without these steps, without these handrails that were added by the Egyptian government later, modern day, it would have been difficult to navigate. So just from this alone, we can conclude that it wasn't meant, it wasn't designed for people to go up and down. It wasn't designed for people. It wasn't designed for creatures, mammals, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't designed for creatures to come up and down this because there's, it was, there's no way it's difficult to even maneuver without the handrails and steps that were added later. So that's not part of the original design. So it wasn't meant for people to go down. It wasn't designed for that. You see what I'm saying? So that's where the pyramid power plant theory came in when it suggested that, okay, then it wasn't designed for people to go down. It was designed for water. Water went down. This, this is what the pyramid power plant theory suggests that water came down. It was designed for water because it, it had no steps. It has no handrails. So it wasn't designed for people. You see what I'm saying? But now... I want to offer an alternative view. Again, this is what this video is about. This is what, in fact, this is what this whole channel is about. Offering alternative views. Mind expanding consciousness. I want to expand your mind real quick. So now, I want to offer alternative views. So again, now, if you notice now. So now, if the passageway was designed. Again, and the key word here is design. And that's the word I want you to focus on for this, this whole video. Keep that in mind. The key word here is designed. If this passageway was designed for water. Why is it that they made it rectangular? Why is it rectangular? If you notice, it's rectangular, both of them. Again, these are from two different pyramids. It's both of them are rectangular. In fact, all of them are rectangular. Right. I've done my research. They're all rectangular. Why would they make them rectangular if it was designed for water? You see what I'm saying? Because if it, would, you know, it would make more sense for, the, for it to be circular. And there's a reason why when we create our pipes today, modern man creates pipes today, all the pipes are circular. You see what I'm saying? Because the way, because water has a tendency to form to the shape that it's been encased in. So if you've got running water, it makes sense to have a circular pipe because the water tends to, you know, go upside down, spin around. You know what I'm saying? That's what that's what water does. So it makes more sense to have a circular pipe. So you're not losing power. You're not losing momentum. You're not losing any pressure. It's all, you see what I'm saying? That's what it makes sense. You know, you see what I'm saying? So why would they make this rectangular why would they make this rectangular and not circular but now if we take a look at this now we see on your left now is basically two circular drill holes basically two circular sections on your left is a circle you know in granite stone and granite both of these are granite i think one's red granite the other one's you know granite. basically this is granite stuff you see what i'm saying and it's two circular drill holes so again what it shows is that these ancient and again this would have been done by the same ancient builders that built the pyramids you see what I'm saying? So the point is that they had the capacity, they had the capabilities to create circular holes or circular channels. So why didn't they? Right? Why didn't they make the descending passageway circular? They had the capacity, they had the tools. They could have done it. Again, this is again, these are circular holes done by the same people that built the pyramids, the same technology that built the pyramids. We clearly see the circular holes. So they had the capabilities, they had the capacity to make circular holes. So why didn't they? Why did they leave it rectangular? And again, it's again it's an important. Some people may think it's not that important, but it is because all descending passage, all pyramids have a descending passageway, and all descending passageways are made rectangular. You see what I'm saying? And if it's supposed to be a water channel, just it being rectangular alone is a design flaw in itself. That's a design flaw because, you know, for the water to, again, there's, there's a reason why circle, you know our pipes are circular. Again, there's a reason for this, you know. So that's a design flaw in itself. So are the pyramids flawed? Or are we missing something? So again, I want to go deep. I want to take you there, guys. I want to take you to the next level. You see what I'm saying? So again, this is it right here. So let's go to the next one. Pyramid chambers. So now here we see the internal passageways and chambers of the Great Pyramid, such as the King's Chamber. So let me get my laser pointer once again. So again, King's Chamber, you see what I'm saying? Grand Gallery, the Queen's Chamber, Subterranean Chamber, a descending passageway, ascending passageway. Again, you see this is the internal structure of the Great Pyramid. You see what I'm saying? Now, based on the Pyramid Power Plant Theory now, I want to explain it. So based on the Pyramid Power Plant Theory now, the water would have came down here now, came down here, all right, into the Subterranean Chamber. Then it would have came back up now, 
and it came to the sending passage and then the, the reaction would have taken place now different chemical reactions would have taken place inside here and then according to the theory now produced this electrical energy thus becoming the pyramid power plant theory so this is what it suggests right but now put the laser pointer away now but now if we take a look at this now here we see the internal structure of the pyramid of Menkari. Now this one's very significant. You see what I'm saying? Now again, also the pyramid of Menkari now is one of the three pyramids. So when you go to Giza, you got those three large pyramids. You got Menkari, Khufu, which you just saw, and then Khafre. But again, this right here is Menkari. So one, this is the three large pyramids on the Giza plateau right here. All right, just before I mention that. So now, again. The reason why this is important is because again we clearly see this is the internal structure and what we know is we know it's a key difference here now for the for the pyramid power plant theory to be accurate it couldn't you know that it would have to apply to all pyramids it would have to apply so so what they say about the the great pyramid because most people when they speak about it they only talk, they only talk about the great pyramid they only show the diagram the internal diagram the internal structure of the great pyramid but and they relate it to the great pyramid but for, for, but for the pyramid power plant theory to be accurate it would have to apply to all pyramids. So again, here we see the internal structure of the pyramid of Mankari, right? And what we notice straight away is that it doesn't have the same chambers. It doesn't have the same chambers, right? Going into the pyramid, what it has, it has a descending passageway, right? Going down, but there is no chambers going into the pyramid. You see what I'm saying? It's all going underneath the ground, underneath the pyramid. But yet, one two thing you must notice is that, but yet it is still a pyramid shape. That's another key factor. It's still a pyramid shape. It only has chambers going underground. It doesn't have any chambers going up into the pyramid itself. It's all underground, but yet and still it is a pyramid shape. But why would the shape even be necessary? Why would the pyramid shape even be necessary if the chambers are just going underground? Why not just create a dome or like even a cube? Why is the pyramid shape even necessary? So again, if we're dealing with electromagnetic, radi electromagnetic radiation, if we're dealing with electromagnetic radiation, according to the pyramid power plant theory, then why do they need such precise angles, precise dimensions, just to transmit electromagnetic radiation? You know, again, the sun transmits electromagnetic radiation every day without precise angles and dimensions so again why is the pyramid shape so important again you know the structure the chambers don't even go inside the pyramid so why is the pyramid shape even necessary it was just about electromagnetic radiation why is the pyramid shape even necessary so again the, the pyramid shape was important but if we're dealing with in terms of frequency and resonance it would have to be important because you have the accuracy and the dimensions will have to be important because that's what that's what happens when you're dealing with frequency you see what i'm saying the dimensions the shape all of these are important factors when you're dealing with frequency when you're dealing with resonance but again if you're dealing with electromagnetism electromagnetic radiation the shape is not important so why is it still a pyramid shape so again there's more to this than meets the eye there's more to this than what you have been previously told and we're going to break this down all right so let's go to the next one Did the pyramids use water? So now this right here, we're really we're really going for it now. We're really gonna assess this now. We're really gonna break this down. So again, let me get my laser pointer one more time. All right then. So now I want to evaluate the pyramid power plant theory. I wanna to come to a conclusion whether or not the pyramid actually used water. I wanna break this down. So again, from this diagram right here now, we see a more in-depth, detailed diagram of the internal structure of the Great Pyramid. Right? And as we can see now, we have the descending passageway that goes right down to the subterranean chamber. Right, We have the ascending passageway. You see what I'm saying? But one thing about the ascending passageway, right? I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but one thing, you can, one thing about the ascending passageway, one key factor is that you have these granite plugs. So what happened was that when you come down here, access to the ascending passageway is actually blocked by these granite plugs you can't enter into this ascending passageway you see what i'm saying there is there is no access access to the ascending passageway is blocked by these huge granite plugs right so this meant that access so again access to the grand gallery would have been there would be no access 
But the reason why we have access today is because they have this so-called robber's entrance, which we're going to go more into this robber's entrance, you know, a little bit later. But so they have this robber's entrance, right, built by a guy named, let's say, Al-Mamun, Al Al right? And that's what, how that's the entrance that people go in today. You don't come up here because you can't get past the granite plugs. You see what I'm saying? Okay, you can't get past the granite plugs. But now, when you go past the first, the ascending passageway now, you have this wild shaft. You have this wild shaft that comes down, then you have the grotto. So wild shaft, grotto, leads down now into the descending passageway now into the subterranean chamber. So you have this wild shaft and you have this grotto, right? So, uh, get rid of the last point now. So again, you have this wild shaft now and you have this grotto, you see. But now if we take a closer look at that grotto, so again, this is the grotto. This is the grotto of the Great Pyramid. Now you see the grotto. Now you see the wild shaft coming down. Again, I'm just showing you on the on the, on the diagram now. But this is a closer look now. The grotto and the wild shaft. You see, what I'm saying, and again, it goes further down into the descending passageway into the subterranean chamber. Now we take a closer look at that subterranean chamber. Now, this is the subterranean chamber, right? Now, what's interesting about the subterranean chamber is that again, when they went down into there, they found that it was quite crude. They said it was quite crude, so what they said was it was unfinished. Here we go again with the unfinished. Because it was so crude, they said, well, you know, based on the other based on you know the other the other stones and other stuff, it's so crude, unfinished. But again, that doesn't that doesn't add up. You know what I'm saying? That doesn't add up. But the fact that the pyramid they would have placed the casing stone on top. All pyramids have the white limestone, the white casing stone. It's no longer there today because it's been removed, but all pyramids had the white had the white limestone white casing stone so why would they put the white casing stone if it wasn't finished so then that's like they're adding the finishing touches you see what i'm saying so again it was finished we can conclude that it was finished so the question is what, what, are, we, what are we really dealing with here so again i want to deal with this so now i want to explain whether or not the pyramids used water so now if we go back we're going to, have to go back now go back back all right, so we go back to the main diagram now. I want I want to deal with this. So again, we see the wild shaft once again. Once again, we see the wild shaft. We see the grotto. Now, so now based on my evaluations, now I've concluded that the wild shaft, this wild shaft right here, that was added later. That was not part of the original design. But again, it looks as if that was added. For purpose of being part of a water system. You see what I'm saying? So again, yes, water did flow through these channels. Water did flow through here. You see what I'm saying? And it, water came down now in the grotto, came down here now. And again, it came into the subterranean chamber. And this ex would explain why the subterranean chamber is so crude. The reason why it looks so crude is because, again, that was thousands of years of water erosion. So this is why it looks so crude. Because thousands of years of water erosion, unfinished. That's not even... That's a joke, really. Unfinished. So again, thousands of years of water erosion, that makes more sense. You see what I'm saying? But what we're dealing with here, it was added later. So the question is, did the pyramids use water? Yes. The pyramids did use water. Water did flow through the channels. But was it designed for that? No, it wasn't. It was not designed for that. That's not what it was designed for. It was adapted this structure has been adapted, adapted by the dynastic Egyptians. They adapted the structure. So the whole pyramid being a water-based system, power plant system, that's actually attributed. That has to be attributed to the dynastic Egyptians. Because a lot of people they talk about, you know, water system, power plant system, but that's the dynastic Egyptians. They did this. Whatever water power plant system that people theorize this to be, it was the dynastic Egyptians that turned it into that. But that's not what it was originally for. That's not what it was designed for. You see what I'm saying? That's, it was adapted by the dynastic Egyptians. Right? But I doubt it functioned the way a lot of people say it functions. So I doubt, you know, there was all these different reactions. Most likely the water wouldn't have went further than here. You know what I'm saying? It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have, it would have stopped right here, realistically. You know. I don't I doubt any, any reactions would have even taken place here. You see what I'm saying? Most likely what it most likely what it was, it would have been just a standard pump. You know, a standard pump like mechanism. Whether or not the water would have actually been electrified, I'm not sure. But most likely it was just standard. It was basically just a standard water pump system. It was a standard system, water pump system. You see what I'm saying? And that's what it was. But again, the structure was adapted. You see what I'm saying? But I doubt it. I doubt 
this water would have caused any major reactions in you know in the grand gallery in the king's chamber in the, i doubt there would have been any major reactions here most likely it wouldn't have just any reactions would have just stopped would have been around here but i doubt there would have been any major reactions it would just be mostly around this area and I, again a standard water pump system but that's what we're dealing with here you see what i'm saying but again they adapted it but what the what actually happened after they adapted this they said you know what let's build our own now let's just build our own in comes the step pyramid of Saqqara. the step pyramid again i speak more about this i go more into this in the instruments of power extended cut you got to get the extended cut guys you need the extended cut you see what i'm saying you need that extended cut but anyway what we so what we're dealing with here isn't it? so what we're dealing with here is that what i'm saying is so yes water did flow through these channels water did flow through these channels guys but it was not designed for that again if, the, if this was a pyramid power and theory now right If this was a pyramid power plant theory, then it must apply to all pyramids. You can't just say it applies to this, but then we have all these other pyramids around Egypt. Found around Egypt, we have to apply to all pyramids. It can't just apply to this. You get what I'm saying? But again, we've already went through the pyramid of Menkara. It doesn't have the same internal chambers. It's all underground. So how would the pyramid power plant theory apply to Menkara then? You see what I'm saying? How would it apply to that? So again, we can't for it to be a pyramid power plant theory, we have to apply to all the pyramids. You see what I'm saying? So again, the question is, did the pyramids use water? Yes. But that's not what it was designed for. Was it designed for water? No, it wasn't. It wasn't designed for that. It was adapted. So now I want to deal with, go forward again now. Now I want to deal with a robber's entrance. So I want to deal with this robber's entrance right here. Let me take a look at this now. What you see from this image right here, you see the so-called al Manum's robber's entrance. Now, I was reading an interesting article. I'll have to leave it in the description box. It was quite interesting. The guy, basically, the guy was explaining this robber's entrance. And what he basically said was that... This, this, the, the story goes that the al -Manum guy and his team came to Egypt looking for treasure. They're looking for treasure now. And it's the first time in Egypt now. And he randomly digs his way through. And just randomly... You know, he randomly makes his way right where the granite plugs end. So the granite plugs are there, so you can't go through the entrance. So the entrance is there right and you can't go through the entrance no you can go through it but you're blocked by the granite plugs so what so what they're saying what this al Manum guy did they're saying he dug his way, way way through first time now first visit right dug his way through and a ra randomly dug his way through now and somehow ended right there where the granite plugs end and what this guy was basically saying in this article was that that doesn't add up Whoever, whoever cut this, whoever cut that tunnel, knew what they was doing. They knew what they was doing. They studied the pyramid, studied what they was doing. They, they was there long enough to be able to study it and knew what they was doing. So he's saying that this, that tunnel was done before Manum even got there. That was already made. Before Manum was even there. You see what I'm saying? So based on what we're dealing with, it would make more sense to say that it was the dynastic Egyptians that carved that tunnel. Because they would have been there long enough to study it. You see what I'm saying? To know where... Where to where to where to where to carve the tunnel so it meets right where the granite plugs end. They you know it would make more sense that the dynastic Egyptians did this. But the reason why they say Amunum, the reason why they attribute it to Amunum is because these are the same people that say that the Egyptians built the pyramids as tombs for their pharaohs, right? They built the pyramids as tombs for their pharaohs, so they can't say that these same people that built the pyramid then dug a robber's entrance to get back into the same pyramid that they built. They can't say that, so this is why they would attribute it to al -Manum. But we know now that, again, they adapted it. The Egyptians didn't build it now, but they adapted it. But considering that there was no way in through the ascending passageway because of the granite blocks, because of the granite blocks, they had to find another way in. Thus, the so-called robbers entrance. So again, the Egyptians built that. They carved that. It would make more sense. But again, they attribute to al -Manum is because it doesn't, they can't say that the Egyptians carved it because according to their own theory, they built those tombs. So this is why they attribute to al -Manu. In reality, it makes more sense that the Egyptians carved this passage, this so-called robber's entrance. We've got, we got to deal with it. We've got to deal with it, guys. So again, let's go to the next one. How did the Great Pyramid function? So now I want to explain how this really functioned now, guys. Now, this is key. This part is key. I want to explain how it really functioned. So I want to explain how it functioned now and the different role of the chambers. I want to explain this. 
So again, we see the inter once again we see the internal structure of the Great Pyramid. Now we take a look at this now. This is the internal structure of the Pyramid of Menkara. And as we can see, like we've shown previously, it has no chambers that go into the pyramid. But instead, it still has the same descending passageway, but instead, the chambers go underground. They go underneath the pyramid. They don't actually go into the pyramid, but yet and still, it's a pyramid shape, right? You see what I'm saying? But again, watch interesting that the, the Great Pyramid also has a descending passageway subterranean chamber. And once again, the laser pointer comes out once again, 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 but I want you to notice now the similarity. Look at the similarity. Descending passageway, some type of subterranean chamber. Descending passageway, subterranean chamber. So already we see a similarity. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go further into my. I'm, I'm going to explain it. So again, we see the similarity already. Right? We see it already, guys. You see what I'm saying? So now, take a look at this now. This is the Pyramid of Khafre. Right? So again, as, as, I, as I mentioned, the three pyramids, Giza Plateau. Khufu, Khafre, Menkara. So this is Khafre now. And what we see now, again, we see the descending passageway now. But again, this pyramid now only has one chamber. One chamber now. So there's a descending passageway now. And what you see is a horizontal passage. Again, what you see is a horizontal passage now that goes straight across. And then we have the chamber that sits right in the middle. You see what I'm saying? But if you notice now, again, Come over to the Great Pyramid now. Again, you see the similarities. Look at the similarities, guys. Horizontal passage. Then we have a chamber right here. And what's also interesting, interesting about the Queen's Chamber is that the Queen's Chamber sits literally directly underneath the tip. It sits directly underneath the tip. And again, we have this chamber right here that sits underneath the tip. According to this diagram, again, sits underneath the tip. So again, look at the similarities right here. Look at the similarities. You see what I'm saying? So again, what we're showing what we're showing here is that again we're seeing the same scenario, guys. So again, there is no mystery here. So all this whole mystery, the great mystery, the, there is no mystery. All it is is a series of cover-ups, a series of lies now. You see what I'm saying? They have led people astray for decades. But now it's time to break the mystery. So now let's take a look at this. Here we see the Grand Gallery. So this is the Grand Gallery of the Great Pyramid. But I want you to take a look at the walls. I want you to focus on the walls and look at the formation of the walls. How the walls are layered over each other. They call it, I think they call it the core belled ceiling or the core belled walls or whatever. But look how it's all layered over. You see what I'm saying? It's layered over. Look at the different layers. Look at the formation. They're laid over like slabs. It's like slabs. But now I want you to take a look at this. Now this right here is the interior chamber. Right? Of the Red Pyramid of Snefru. And again, look at the walls. Look at the similar design again, it's laid over like slabs. So this is the Grand Gallery on your left of the Great Pyramid. And this is the internal chamber of the Pyramid of Snefru. The Red Pyramid of Snefru. Again, look at the, how it's laid over like slabs. It's the same scenario here, guys. Look at this. Again, when you're dealing with the walls now, they could have made it smooth. They could have made it smooth, but they intended to make it like this. They intended to make it like this where it lays over like slabs. But look at the similarities. Is the picture on the left not the same as the picture on the right? Is it not the same scenario? Are we not dealing with the same scenario, guys? Again, look at this. We're dealing with some stuff right here, guys. So now, you may ask, what does all this mean? You may ask, what does all this mean? So now, I want to put this all together now. I want to put this all together. So you may ask, what does all this mean? So this right here now is the image of the, again, the internal structure of the Great Pyramid. But this is when they came out, this is when they did the whole scan thing, the whole scan. And they spoke about the void, there was this big void, right? And they did the scan, you know, muon particles, it is muon particles. And they scanned it now and found this big void. But what we got to understand is that, in reality, this is, this is irrelevant. This is actually irrelevant news, realistically. It was irrelevant because, again, this is, we're not even dealing, we're not even, this ain't even dealing with what, what, what the function is, what, what the actual function is. You see what I'm saying? So again, this is actually irrelevant. This was beyond irrelevant, guys. So really, I want to put this all together. I want to I want to break this down. So now, so 
So based on what I've shown, so, so, so now if we put this all together now, based on what I've just shown you now, not all pyramids have the same internal structure. They don't have the same internal structure, but we notice now, based on other pyramids now, Menkare, Khafre, we notice similarities. We notice the similarity. We saw the similarities with the Queen's Chamber. We saw the similarities with the Subterranean Chamber. We saw the similarities, guys. So again, based on my theory now, so based on all this now, my theory here is this. Each of these sections, King's Chamber, Grand Gallery, Queen's Chamber, Subterranean Chamber, each of these sections, guys, they're different departments. Different departments that have individual functions. And they were meant to function separately, not as a single unit. So it wasn't meant to function as a single unit as previously thought. So, so based on the pyramid power of theory, they had it functioning as a single unit. But what I'm trying to say is that it never functioned as a single unit. They had separate functions. They're each different departments and they had separate functions. So I want you to imagine the pyramid like being like an electric razor, right? All right and you know how you don't get those razors now? I've, I've, I've got one of them. They've got this razor where it's wireless now and you can take it's interchangeable. They've got interchangeable attachments. I'm not talking about the, I'm not talking about the different guards. I'm talking about where you can take the whole, you know, the whole part off. You see what I'm saying? You can take the whole off the whole blades and the teeth and everything and put new blades, new teeth on new attachments. So imagine it like that, different attachments. So the Queen's Chamber, Grand Gallery, King's Chamber, those are different attachments. The attachable razor blades, the different attachments. And also when you put on these different attachments now, it provides different effects, you know, trimming the beard, doing the edges. Again, it provides different effects. So again, these are different attachments. But the Great Pyramid has all of these in one. So the Great Pyramid, again, it was the greatest pyramid of all because it combined all the different apartment departments with all their different effects in one structure. You see what I'm saying? But now this also explains the granite plugs. Remember how we spoke about the granite plugs? So the granite plugs is right here. So you have the ascending passageway and you have the granite plugs that was right here that blocked access to the ascending passageway. This is why they were put in there as a way to separate separate the functions because they each had different functions. The subterranean chamber had a function. You see what I'm saying? The subterranean chamber, chamber had a function that they wanted to separate from the rest of the pyramid because they operated independently. So the subterranean chamber was its own function. And then that was there to block it now. To block anything anything else taking place. And then once they, if, they, if, if it came past here now, this had its own function. You see what I'm saying? That had its own function. But also, what's also interesting, what I also, what I also found out recently, was that you have this antechamber. So right here before you get into the king's chamber, so this is the king's chamber right here. You have this small little chamber right here. It's not really a chamber, basically you have to crouch down. You have to crouch down, and then you get into this. But when you crouch down now, they call this part the antechamber, because what they found is when you look above you, there's these grooves on the walls, there's grooves, which indicate that there was some type of slabs there, rock slabs, granite slabs. So if the granite slabs were there, based on the grooves, the evidence is that there was something that was removed there, and whatever was there blocked access to the king's chamber, so you wouldn't have even had, had access to the king's chamber. So again, the tomb theory, that's out, that's out the door. You see what I'm saying? That's out the door. You know, that's out the door, guys. Really? So we're not even, we're not even going to deal with that. So again, you wouldn't have had access to you know, um, the king's chamber. You see what I'm saying? So again, these are different departments. This is its own department. This is its own department. These are their own departments. And that's why that's why they put the granite plugs there to separate the different departments, guys. So again, we're breaking the mystery. This is ground breaking stuff, guys. This really is. You know. So again, they're all they were all different departments that functioned separately, not as a single unit. So what we're saying, so what was so what we're saying is that water did flow through these channels, but it wasn't designed to be a water-based system. That's not what it was designed for. It was adapted. The dynastic Egyptians adapted the structure. They added this well shaft granite. They added that it was it was adapted by the dynastic Egyptians. You see what I'm saying? But also what I found also in research I found out there was in the Giza Plateau now, yet there's a lot of underground tunnels and passageways. Which again forms some type of complex, which would have been a part of a complex water system. But again, these passageways, these underground tunnels in the Giza Plateau, that's all dynastic Egyptians. They would have did all of that. You see what I'm saying? They would have did all of those things. Because a lot of people now, upon discovery of these underground tunnels, this has since been attributed to a time before the pharaohs. But there is no evidence that those tunnels are as old as the pyramids themselves. So again, the dynastic Egyptians did that. 
And again, but some people don't believe that because they say, well, what did they have? What did they have? Again, guys, instruments of power extended cut. We're going to show it to you. We're going to show you. I'll show you the technology that they was dealing with. Instruments of power extended cut. I break it down. You see what I'm saying? So they had the capabilities to cut those, cut those tunnels. They had the capabilities. You see what I'm saying? So again, the real truth is that the dynasty Egyptians are not giving up, are not being given enough credit. They're not getting the credit they deserve. You see what I'm saying? The dynasty Egyptians are not getting the credit that they deserve. Right. So what so the, so again the conclusion here is that the, the Egyptians found the pyramids. Yes, they did. They found it. They didn't build the pyramids, but they adapted it. They studied it. They learned about it. They studied it. They adapted it. They turned it into this water system, this power plant theory. They turned it into that. You see what I'm saying? They turned it into that. They knew what it was. You see what I'm saying? But they knew they couldn't use it for what it was originally intended for. But the structure was still very alive. It still carried a resonance. It still had an energy signature. So they knew they could use it as a power source. But it had to be water based. You see, it had to be water based. So the pyramids themselves were not built by the dynastic Egyptians. That, te that technology was beyond them. But they knew how it worked. And they knew they could use it for other purposes. So the whole Giza site with all its tunnels and passageways was built over time by the dynastic Egyptians. Again, which also shows how old Egypt really is. You see what I'm saying? For, so for them to have studied the pyramids, developed all the sciences, you couldn't have studied the pyramids, developed all the sciences in only a few thousand years. It took time for this. So again, it's, it shows how old it really is. But also, when you're dealing with the power plant theory now, again, they say that the water... Or there was a river, there was a stream that once flowed underneath the pyramids. And that's how, that's how it functioned. You see what I'm saying? But it no longer flows today. Which also, again, it no longer flows today. Because, and the reason being, based on my theory, is that it would have been, because it, it was a man-made river. It wasn't intended to be a water system. But the dynastic Egyptians built a man-made man -made river. Diverted water from the Nile, from the Mediterranean Sea. So it could flow towards the pyramids, but it wasn't intended for that. So that's why the water is no longer there, because that's not what it was designed for. So when that man-made river dried up, it went back to its source, which was the Nile. You see what I'm saying? So now that explains the water system, guys. It explains the water system. You see what I'm saying? So again, the pyramids, water did flow through these channels. But that's not what it was originally designed for, guys. That's not what it was designed for. So again, what we're dealing with, so based on what I've said in other videos, the the pyramids was built on another space and time. They were not built on this dimension. So the way it worked would not be the same way things work on this dimension. You see what I'm saying? The laws of phys physics would have been different. The laws of ferrodynamics, all of the different energy laws would have been different because it wasn't built on this dimension. So in other words, the pyramids ran on a much subtler energy. As electricity is not the highest form of energy, the highest form of energy would be pure energy itself. So again, a lot of people, they, they, they just think in terms of electricity because that's, that's, they think that's the highest form of energy, that's the highest form of energy. But in reality, the highest form of energy is pure energy itself and that was the energy of the pyramids. It ran on pure energy. So it never needed water to work. That's my statement right here. I know it's like, it might say controversial. It may sound like a controversial statement, but after watching this video now, maybe you guys can, you know, see where I'm coming from now. It never needed water to work. It was more advanced than that. You see what I'm saying? Water was not in the original plan of the pyramids, so it wasn't just a large hydroelectric dam that people have theorized. Again, if that was the case, why is it a pyramid shape? The electricity doesn't require a specific shape. You don't need a specific shape, specific dimensions and angles and all of these things just for electricity. And even that, why would they go for more, or so much trouble? Megalithic stones, huge megaliths, huge granite blocks, granite plugs, just for electricity. You don't need all that just for electricity, guys. You see what I'm saying? But again, the shape and angles and position was so important is because they were tuned into a specific frequency. It was about frequency. It was about resonance. But with all this being said, I've still yet to explain the actual process. I haven't explained the process yet. I've explained how it functioned, how it worked, but I haven't explained the process. How did all how did all of this how did all of this really work? How did it work? You see what I'm saying? But again, as just as I've mentioned now, it was based on pure energy. It was powered by pure energy. So how did all this work? 
where did this pure energy come from and how did it function within the pyramid well that's the end of the video guys unfortunately that's the end of the video but it's not the end of the presentation guys so i would hope that you guys could follow me to the other side where i will take you to the next level again right here we're already this is groundbreaking stuff but i really want to raise the bar this is this is groundbreaking but i want to take it to the next level i want to raise the bar We've done it previously in other videos. I raised the bar, but the, we can go even. We can go even higher. I want to take you to the next level. So again, I hope you guys can follow me to the other side now, where we're going to the extended cuts. And in that vid and in the next part now, I will explain the true process of the pyramid, how they actually the energy that they actually ran on, right? And also, I will go into other ancient sites, including the Valley Temple, the Old Syrian. You see what I'm saying? What was the Osirian really for? What was that for? I'm going to break it down. And also other sites found in Peru. So again, I hope you guys can follow me to the other side. I'll leave the link in the description box. But again, this right here is the end of the video, guys. So again, it's not. It's again, it's the end of the video, but not the end of the presentation. Again, links will be in the description. But again, guys, this is the end of the video. Again, this is groundbreaking stuff. This really is groundbreaking stuff. You see what I'm saying? So again, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you took some good information from this. All right, people. Thanks for watching.